Well, good evening. Welcome into our Wednesday night live broadcast. In fact, <clears throat> we think our last one, at least for now, as next Wednesday night, we will start back uh, with um, a meeting in the building at 7 p.m. And uh, for those of you who are, who are part of Lancaster Church of Christ, we're looking forward to that, and um, you know we're slowly coming back online with the services that we have missed for a year. So, looking forward to getting back together. We will not be broadcasting like this at least uh, next Wednesday night, uh, but uh, it, it times up well because we're finishing up the study we've been doing for several weeks now on Wednesday night on testing the spirits. And we're going to be looking at the fifth and last test out of 1 John chapter 4. Again, just hope it's been a good study for you. And really the, the purpose of, has been to um, give you some tools to help evaluate teaching that you hear. Um, there's certainly a lot of teachers, a lot of churches, a lot of tr truth claims out there. And we need to be able to discern them. That is to decide, is it really from God? Is it really true? We are to be a people concerned with truth. And John in 1 John 4 um, gave his initial readers and now us all these centuries later, five great ways to evaluate um, what he calls the spirits. Um, and we understand to mean uh, <clears throat> claims to truth, teachers, teachings, churches, uh, however we want to think of it, and applying it to our situation. So that's where we are. Uh, we're going to look at this fifth one. It won't take us very long tonight. Maybe we'll have a little bit of time for reflection and review uh, before we're done. Uh, but again, this, this text is in 1st John chapter 4 and I uh, remember the way we sort of started out noting the strange command that opens 1st John 4 uh, where he says brothers or beloved do not believe um, we're not used to hearing that in scripture do not believe but it's uh, made more specific when he says do not believe every spirit but test the spirits to see whether they're from God. And then he gives the reason that is needed because John says, even in, think of this, even in the first century, the first 50 or 60 years of uh, the church, he says many false prophets have gone out into the world. If that had happened in the first 60 years, imagine how much that's multiplied over 2000 years. Many false prophets have, have gone out into the world. And then he starts giving the tests in, in, in verse 2, uh, where he says, By this you know the Spirit of God. Every spirit that confesses that Jesus Christ has come in the flesh is from God. Remember we talked about how important um, saying true things or, or teaching true things about Jesus is. That was test number one. Uh, does the Spirit say the right things about Jesus? And then it goes on uh, in the rest of those eight verses. Tonight's test, number five, comes in verses seven and eight, where he says, Beloved, let us love one another, for love is from God, and whoever loves has been born of God and knows God. Anyone who does not love does not know God because God is love. So test number five from verses uh, seven and eight is, does the spirit, the teaching, the teacher, the church, whatever, does it promote the love of God? Does it promote the love of God? And when we ask that question, we're not just asking, does it promote loving God? 
certainly that's a big part of it, maybe the biggest part of it. It's not only loving God himself, but um, as we'll see, uh, the love of God in the sense of loving others. When you think about the work of the Holy Spirit in our lives as we have experienced it and as we uh, have learned about it in Scripture, what is the first sign of the Holy Spirit's work in our lives? I don't know if you ever thought about that question. The first sign of the Holy Spirit's work, or maybe I could give a little more of a clue of what I'm aiming at here. Uh, what is the first fruit of the Spirit? You know, in Galatians chapter 5, we have this list of the fruit of the Spirit. Sometimes we mistake and we call it the fruits of the Spirit. Um, there are several things that make up the fruit of the Spirit as a whole. But the first thing that's listed in Galatians 5, and verse 22, is love. So we have, you know, the list starts out love. The fruit of the Spirit is love, joy, peace, patience, kindness, and, and so on. But the first in the list, and I think it's significant uh, that it's the first one, the first is love. And so uh, the first sign of the Spirit's work in a person is love. Uh, the first part of the fruit of the Spirit is love. And this love, again, is, is love of God, certainly. Uh, but also love of others. That's tied with it. And the one who tied those two loves together was none other than, none other than the Son of God. Remember uh, his comments about the greatest commandment. Um, Matthew chapter 22, you remember somebody comes to Jesus. In fact, it's a lawyer, um, the text says. Matthew chapter 22, verse 36. And he comes with a question. His question, Matthew tells us, is designed to test Jesus. And he says, teacher, which is the greatest commandment in the law? You've probably heard many times um, it's said that there were over 600 commandments, depending on how you count them. Some people get as specific as saying 613 commandments in the Old Testament law. Uh, I've never done the count myself, so I'll say over 600. But there's a bunch. Um, and the, the, this person comes to Jesus and says, which is the greatest of all? And Jesus is going to give an answer that uh, the one who asked the question is impressed by, agrees with, um, because he says to him in response in verse 37, you shall love the Lord your God with all your heart and with all your soul and with all your mind. This is the first and, and uh, this is the great and first commandment. The Lord says. And then you recall how he followed that up. He didn't stop there, but he said, and a second is like it. You shall love your neighbor as yourself. On these two commandments depend all the law and the prophets. So Jesus ties together love of God and love of others. Uh, he says it, love your neighbor as you love yourself. Um, so any spirit, let's use John's language from 1 John 4, any spirit claiming to be from God or claiming to have a message from God must promote true love of God first. Okay, so we would, we would automatically reject any spirit or teacher who who didn't promote the love of God. I mean, it would seem ridiculous. Why would we listen if they said anything other than love God? Uh, but th that seems evident on its face. But what does it mean? You know, does it just mean have warm feelings for 
Uh, does it mean uh, like? What does it mean to love God? Uh, Jesus helps us again. You might, might remember Jesus saying, if you love me, do you remember how he finished that statement? In John chapter 14 and verse 15, if you love me, keep my commandments. Jesus equated love of himself, love of God, with doing what God said, keeping his commandments. So it's more than just a feeling, a warm feeling. Uh, obviously, this love of God has some action to it. So any spirit claiming to be from God or to, to have words or a message from God must promote true love of God first, and then second, must promote love of others, love of the brethren uh, in the old way of saying it, um, love of brothers and sisters, fellow believers, but not just that, as we'll see, love of humanity in general. So for this, let's uh, read a little bit more in First John, because uh, you're probably aware of how prominent just the topic of love is in First John. Uh, it's, if you never took Greek, um, when, when you're a student in Bible school, Bible college, seminary, whatever you call it, um, and you're learning Greek, and, and you've got your basics down, you've gone through the first half year or so of your study, very often the first place you get to translate in the New Testament is 1 John. It's some of the easiest Greek in the New Testament, and it's repetitive, so, you know, if you get a certain phrase early in the book, you may well translate it several times. You become very familiar with the word for love, for instance, the Greek word for love, because it's all throughout John's writing, even his gospel, uh, but especially in 1 John. So, 1 John chapter 4, again, we just read a moment ago, uh, verses 7 and 8 that, that promote this fifth test that we're talking about. If you just skip down to verse 10, John says, In this is love, not that we have loved God, but that he loved us and sent his son to be the propitiation for our sins. We'll have to take another class sometime to talk about what that means, the propitiation, if you're not familiar with it. Very important word. But then verse 11, beloved, if God so loved us, we also ought to love one another. So John defines love in terms of what God has done for us, and then what we in turn, how we treat one another. If God loved us so greatly, we also ought to love one another. Uh, and so that gets us into this second part of this of this test when we're talking about does it promote the love of God not just the love of God the being God our God but others as well that's tied up in it go back one chapter in first John to chapter 3 and verse 11 let's just note a couple of verses here that fills this out first John It's interesting language that John uses there, isn't it? Uh, when he says from the beginning, does he mean from the very beginning of time, from the, the time of creation, perhaps? Or is he talking about the beginning in the sense of when, when these people he was writing to first heard the gospel and first became believers? This is the message that you have heard from the beginning. Either way, it's an, it makes an impression. What is that message? that we should love one another. So from the very beginning, you have learned this truth that we ought to love one another. Skip down to verse 14, same chapter, and the first part of that verse, he says, we know that we have passed out of death into life 
because we love the brothers. Think of that, that verse. We, we know that we have passed out of death into life. We know that we have eternal life, that we're no longer dying in our sins. How do we know that? Well, you know, if you were asked that question, someone come and ask you, how do you know that you have eternal life? I'm going to guess that you probably wouldn't answer exactly the way John does here. Because John says, how do we know we have eternal life? Because we love the brothers. We love our fellow believers. Whoever does not love, he says, abides in death. So loving others is a huge part of this. And then just a couple other, one other paragraph here. Uh, verse 16, beginning. By this we know love. How do we know love? That he laid down his life for us, referring to the Lord. That he laid down his life for us. By this we know love. And we ought to lay down our lives for the brothers. Uh, we know the love of God because he gave himself for us. And we understand that we give ourselves for the brothers. But the next verse is very important because it extends it. Because so, we've been talking a lot about loving the brothers, the brothers and sisters, the fellow believers. But it's not just that, this love we're talking about. Verse 17, but if anyone has the world's goods and sees his brother in need, yet closes his heart against him, how does God's love abide in him? Little children, let us not love in word or talk, but in deed and in truth. Uh, again, it's this love we're talking about is it's not just a feeling, it is an action. It's taking care of people in need. Uh, when we have the ability to do so, when we have the world's goods. And um, that's all part of it. So, test number five, as we evaluate teaching, teachers, spirits, um, claims to truth, does it promote the love of God, which means not only loving God, but loving, loving people. Uh, I think this, this one, number five, is very important to keep in mind as we work through one through four. Um, as we apply one through four, let's remember what those are. Somebody comes and gives a teaching. We ask, does it teach the true Jesus? Does it say correct things about Jesus? That's number one. That's from verses two and three of 1 John 4. Number two, is it against worldliness? Does it oppose worldliness? That's verses four and five of our chapter. Number three, does it uphold God's word? That's from verse six. Does it uphold the word of God? And number four, does it promote truth? That's also from verse six. But as we work our way through, you know, and we're evaluating teaching or teachers or churches or whatever it might be, we work our way through those first, first four. Number five, we need to keep in mind because there's a great temptation uh, to to uh, sort of suppress the love principle when we are deciding whether to believe something or not, or to believe someone. We can get so wrapped up in one through four. I mean, some people make an entire career out of that. Uh, they think the job of a Christian is to, to seek out false teachers and to condemn them and and to be not very kind about it at times that's why we have at least in part test number five does 
the claim to truth promote the love of God. You see, and that will not only evaluate the, the spirit that we're analyzing, the teacher that we're analyzing, but it'll also evaluate us and the way uh, we are handling things. We are to pe people who exalt truth, who love truth and seek truth out. We are to be a people who preach truth, but we do so in love. We preach truth in, because we love God and we love people, not because we um, like to pick others apart. That is never the goal. And so test number five is important not only for uh, to be applied to the, the teaching in question, but to those of us who are doing this spiritual discerning. You know, are we doing so with the right attitude? Uh, we can do these and we can, you know, we can come across a teaching and discover, you know, this, this person really isn't saying the right thing about Jesus, for instance. They don't pass test number one. Uh, we can do that without being unloving and unconcerned. Um, I think of the example in the New Testament of Apollos. You remember Apollos was a very powerful teacher, but he hadn't learned everything he needed to learn. Uh, this story is out of the book of Acts. And... Uh, Aquila and Priscilla, uh, a Christian couple, take him aside and, and teach him uh, the Word of God more perfectly. Uh, and we don't have a lot of details about that, but certainly it seems that they did so in a spirit of love and concern for him and uh, that he took it well and and uh, carried on, no doubt, was a very powerful evangelist for, for Jesus. Uh, often, if we apply these tests to people and, and find out that what they're saying does not pass the test, even if we have opportunity to confront them in, with a loving spirit, uh, they may not respond well. We're just not guaranteed that they will. And oftentimes we won't have any opportunity to, to confront them individually because uh, we're just not in their circle. Uh, but maybe we can influence those that they're influencing. Uh, to, to do that, though, and to have real influence, we're going to have to show a lot of love. And uh, that's part of why this fifth test is here. So test the spirits. Don't believe every spirit but test them to see whether they're from God. And we're not left to figure that out for ourselves, at least in this passage. We have five ways that we can do that uh, straight from the inspired word of God. And, and I hope this will be a, a, a good thing to have in your discernment toolbox, uh, for lack of a better term. Again, appreciate you being a part of these broadcast studies each week. Uh, looking forward to being together next week and to, to interact in uh, a different study. And uh, just thank you for your support and your interest in, in the truth of God's word. Let's pray. Our God, we bow before you. Uh, grateful for your love and care, for not leaving us to fend for ourselves in these things, but giving us your truth, preserving it down through the centuries so we can have wisdom. Help us to, uh, to apply it well. Help us to be good at discerning what is true and what is not so we can know how to live before you. Again, we pray your blessings on all those um, in our circle and, and uh, in our study tonight. Please take care of them and strengthen them. And for those that are, are suffering in any way this evening, we ask your 
love and blessings be showered on them. Thank you for allowing us to, to be in your word and to communicate with you. We pray all this in the name of Jesus, our Savior. Amen.